microphones in the ceilings uh, so that during uh, questions and answers we don't have to pass the microphone around and as you can already hear that the sound is is, is different so uh, we certainly appreciate the attention to education will continue to, to stream uh, you may have seen some of our conferences on, on YouTube and I intermittently get some emails from people far outside of the DCRI that have seen our conferences on YouTube will continue to archive as, uh, as, as well. So uh, our speaker today is uh, Dr. Tom Hofsick. Tom is uh, an assistant professor within the Division of Cardiology. He's an interventional cardiologist that works at Duke University Medical Center and also at the Durham VA Hospital. By, by way of introduction, Tom completed his uh, bachelor's and master's degrees at Bowling uh, Green in chemistry, mathematics, and German. He then went to Caltech uh, to do his PhD, uh, doing a lot of molecular biology and DNA uh, binding. He then went from Caltech to Harvard to do his uh, MD degree. Uh, and then came to, to Duke uh, as a resident yep. uh, and then fellow. Uh, spent some time with uh, our Nobel laureate, Dr. La Leskowitz, and uh, if that wasn't enough, decided to do interventional cardiology training uh, as well. So an, an, an incredible pedigree and quite honestly an incredible uh, person. Uh, Tom has uh, started to spend a, a little bit of time with us at the DCRI. Uh, coordinating uh, clinical trials. And as a part of that, and also taking full advantage of his very unique background, he's done some work in cell-based uh, therapies, which he's kind enough to come and talk with us about today. So, Tom, Thanks. welcome. Thank you, Rick. Thanks for the great introduction. Um, so Rick asked me to uh, talk a little bit about cell therapy for cardiovascular disease, and I thought this would be fairly timely since we've been asked recently to respond to a variety of proposals for people looking to help us uh, run clinical trials in this uh, area. And um, this is a slide that I've been shown for quite a few years. It's, uh, and I showed it here mostly to highlight the fact that um, there's a lot of work being done in cell therapy and regenerative therapy uh, throughout the campus. And I think that one of the things that's come up repeatedly when we file for proposals is how we integrate work that's being done throughout the institution with what we're trying to accomplish here. So this is Ken Poss's lab where he uses a zebrafish model to study myocardial regeneration. And these fish are pretty remarkable because you can resect about 30% of the heart and they regenerate uh, uh, completely normal heart tissue. And he's been working for the last decade on identifying the molecular mechanisms that are responsible for this regenerative capacity, which we obviously don't have. Um, and you know, I think that one of the things that we might be able to do a better job of is reaching across the institution, um, because as these people try to look toward bringing these types of findings toward clinical work, we should be involved at an early phase in, in, uh, in helping them do that. So humans don't regenerate heart muscle quite the way zebrafish do, but this is one of those experiments that uh, sort of when it comes out makes you wonder, why didn't I think of that? It's a very simple, elegant exper experiment where these investigators took human hearts and took advantage of the fact that the amount of C14 in the atmosphere has dramatically changed over the years. So there was very, basically almost no C14 in the atmosphere up until the time of the initial nuclear atomic bomb testing experiments. And then it dramatically went skyward, and then since it's fallen, as these testing have been um, uh, uh, stopped. And so what they were able to demonstrate is they were able to extract cardiomyocytes from hearts and look at the C14 content in their DNA. And if these cardiac cells were not dividing, where there was no regeneration in the heart, one would expect that the C14 content would reflect the atmospheric content at the time the patient was, or the subject was born. And it turns out this isn't quite the case. There's actually a degree of cardiomyocyte turnover that's much more active as we're younger and then tailors off as we're older to the point where we get about one in 200 cells turned over per year when we get up into our 50s to 70s. Um, if you end up totaling the amount of turnover over the patient's lifetime, you see that about half the heart ends up being regenerated or turned over during an average patient's lifetime. So we do have some reparative capacity, but it's extremely limited. 
So I'm going to focus for the rest of the talk on um, what's been done to target three areas in cardiac disease. Uh, there's an additional area, peripheral vascular disease, that some people here at DCRI have been very involved in, notably Manesh and Schuyler. Um, and I'm not going to comment on that. So the three areas that have been primarily targeted for stem cell therapy are acute myocardial infarction, chronic cardiomyopathy, and ischemic heart disease or angina. So acute MI was, is by far the most studied of these patient populations. This, these studies go back to the early 2000s when first proof of concept studies were performed and led to a series of trials which were primarily done in the mid 2000s. This is the largest of the trials that's been done to date. I, I still think it's the largest trial. Um, it was run by a group out of Frankfurt called Repair AMI. It was a double blinded study where they took patients who had had an acute myocardial infarction um, and randomized them to either intracoronary infusion of placebo or bone marrow cells that were derived from the patient's own bone marrow. And the idea would be that these patients have an infarct that leaves scar tissue that leads to eventual chronic LV dilatation and chronic heart failure. And if somehow these cells could prevent infarct expansion, that they would prevent the sequelae of the myocardial infarction. So this was um, what for this field is a fairly large phase two study. It was 204 patients. Um, and showed that the, uh, in, uh, when comparing left ventricular angiograms that were done at baseline and four months later, that there was about a 3% improvement in injection fraction in placebo-treated patients compared to a 5.5% improvement in the bone marrow cell-treated patients. This was one of two back-to-back -back papers in the New England Journal at the time. The other trial was the AS, uh, ASTEMI trial, which was actually completely negative, showed no uh, impact on bone marrow cells on, on ejection fraction. So the Frankfurt group's been very diligent. They've uh, published and completed five-year follow-up on these patients. This is actually an MRI sub-cohort of these studies, of these patients, showing that they uh, have an improvement in ejection fraction, which remains durable out to five years. Um, this is, however, a small cohort. This is only 26 of the initial 200 patients that were studied that were included in this MRI cohort. But at least there's some suggestion that in the studies where there's been an initial effect demonstrated that the effect has been durable over time. And then there's been a series of meta-analyses that have combined um, the variety of small trials that were conducted in this space, and all of them come to fairly similar conclusions. This was a series that was done after the initial set of trials was published in the mid-2000s, showing that there was an improvement in ejection fraction of somewhere between about 3 and 4 percent in the bone marrow cell-treated patients compared with the controls. More recently, there's been another series of three meta-analyses, and I actually just got asked to review one for the American Heart Journal, which has updated these initial set. And this is just one table from one of the analysis showing the number of trials that have been published. Many of these small, single center, 40, 50, many of them, some of them even less than 20 patient studies. Again, if you look at the meta-analysis, they come to fairly similar conclusions. Uh, the, the, these, each of these meta-analyses kind of screen for trials based on different criteria, but improvement in the ejection fraction of somewhere between 2 and 4 percent, which is highly statistically significant. But importantly now, you know, the numbers of patients that have been studied in these randomized trials is upwards of 1,500 to 3,000 patients, depending on how, which papers you include in the meta-analysis. Uh, looking at infarct size by MRI, you see that there's a suggestion that you get a reduction in infarct size by MRI using stem cell therapy. So um, Chris and I were actually part of an initial uh, attempt to uh, be part of an NIH network, which the NIH founded in 2006 called the Cell Therapy Research Network, that was, whose goal was to conduct cell therapy research throughout the United States. They actually picked five centers and conducted two trials in the acute MI space, the time trial and the late time trial, which I'll present just shortly. These, all the studies that they coordinated were similar in their first round of funding. These are about 100 to 150 patient trials. Time looked at anterior MI with an EF of less than 40%, 45% as assessed locally. They administered cells that were isolated using a CPAX machine, which is a little different than the way cells are isolated in some of the other trials, and used MRI endpoints. And 
in the time trial, they showed absolutely no effect in, uh, in treated patients. So the improvement in ejection fraction was about 3% in both groups, whether you got placebo or, or, or bone marrow cell treatment. Time was actually designed to look at whether or not infusion of cells three days post-infarct was different than infusing cells seven days post-infarct. Obviously, since there was no effective cell therapy, it's hard to say that you'd be able to detect the difference between the day three and day seven. They, in all of these NHLBI trials, they do a bunch of uh, subset analysis, and they came to the conclusion that young patients treated at day seven had a significant improvement in EF compared with placebo when treated with bone marrow cell-treated patients, but um, that's one of many analyses they performed. This is a, the results of late time, which likewise was, a uh, well, didn't show any effect in bone marrow cell-treated patients. The rationale behind late time was that many patients are not eligible for stem cell therapy acutely within the time window that's initially been studied which is in sort of that three to 10 day time period after an acute event. And so the, this asked whether the question of whether or not giving step, stem cells weeks to months after an, uh, an acute event would be beneficial, and again showed uh, no efficacy. Now, as I indicated previously, there's now been you know, close to at least 1,500 patients that have been randomized in these acute MI stem cell trials. Repair AMI has followed these patients very closely. They uh, have almost complete follow-up on the initial 200 patients that they followed for five years. And consistently throughout the one, two, and five-year period, they've reported that the event rate in the placebo group patients was higher than it is in bone marrow cell treated patients, whether one looks at mortality or a combination of mortality and heart failure revascularization, or a combination of heart failure, uh, death, and other endpoints. And if you look at meta-analyses of clinical endpoints, there is a suggestion that in, um, <coughs> in some of these studies that there's a reduction in death or, and a reduction in either the, a composite endpoint or heart failure uh, rehospitalization <coughs> in patients that have <coughs> bone marrow cells. And this has actually led the Europeans, uh, per, I, I think greatly uh, encouraged by Dr. Zier, who ran the Repair AMI trial, uh, to fund and hopefully run a collaborative effort uh, across the European Union that's being funded by the ESC Cell Therapy Trial Consortium of a mortality study. This trial um, has been uh, in planning stages for at least four years and has undergone a significant amount of evolution, but at its last iteration is an open-label trial of bone marrow cell therapy uh, with standard of care in 3,000 patients, all of whom will undergo echo assessment of ejection fraction fo four days after reperfusion, and the echo will be, led, will be read at a central core lab to prevent enrollment of patients who are you know, too healthy or who have not had significant LV dysfunction. The primary endpoint is gonna be two-year mortality. The assumption is that there will be 12% mortality in this patient population at two years, and it's powered for a 25% relative risk reduction or a 3% decrease in absolute mortality over two years, assuming 10% loss to follow-up. So we've had the opportunity recently of responding to an RFP from Amersite. They are currently conducting, these are the sort of the, the um, sponsors that I know of that are looking at cell therapy in this uh, indication in addition to the Europeans, which are looking at unselected bone marrow cells. <clears throat> Amersite is currently running a phase two protocol enrolling 160 patients at 30 sites, looking at spec perfusion imaging as a primary endpoint. They are currently uh, thinking about expanding this to a phase three study, which is a little bit ill-defined, but we recently put in a proposal to coordinate this study. Um, I think we'd have a lot to add to the study in terms of logistics and planning of the study. Um, but uh, we'll, we should be hearing back from, from the sponsor, I would think, by the end of the month. There's a couple other opportunities we have. Cytori is a company that uses adipose-derived uh, mesenchymal stem cells, so they have a device which allows you to do liposuction at the bedside, uh, get fat, put the fat into, it almost looks like a, uh, a mixer, and out come the stem cells after about an hour uh, period, and then you infuse the cells right back into the patient uh, intracoronary. They completed a phase one study uh, called Apollo, which was 14 patients. 
suggesting a uh, reduction in infarct size by MRI. Again, very small patient population. They're currently running a 360 patient study in Europe for which they hope to get regulatory CE mark for their device because in Europe this is marketed as a device and not as a cell therapeutic. Uh, Juventus is a company that has a non uh, has a plasmid non-viral vector that uh, enhances expression of SDF1 which is stromal derived factor 1 which is the key chemoattractant for stem cells and they're investigating this in acute myocardial infarction and Atherosis has had a program for many years but I don't think it's all um, yeah, so, so I'm going to switch over to cell therapy for congestive heart failure. This is an area where we've actually been involved in. Um, this was actually one of the first trials that I was able to work on here at the DCRI uh, under the guidance of Chris O'Connor. Um, we designed a program for a company called BioHeart. Just as a reminder, you know, dating back to our basic science roots across the street, the first uh, cell therapy for cardiomyopathy was actually initially uh, devised by Doris Taylor here, which was these myoblasts, which is taking muscle cell precursors from peripheral muscle and showing in rabbits that they could improve ejection fraction. And those initial experiments were done when Doris was here at Duke in collaboration with Don Glauber. This eventually led to a series of trials which used myoblasts in patients with uh, cardiomyopathy. These cells are a little different than other cells because these cells are able to survive in scar tissue, so they are been targeted primarily to people who have formed scar tissue in their hearts, not people who have viable myocardium. And uh, we worked with BioHeart back in about 2006 to design what was hoped to be a pivotal study in this field, enrolling 390 patients with ischemic cardiomyopathy who had a, an area of defined scar who would undergo randomization to high dose, low dose, or placebo injection of, uh, of, uh, of myoblasts. And um, so these pay, this was a fully double-blinded study. The primary endpoints were improvement in exercise time and Minnesota failure living with heart failure scores. So there were clinical endpoints designed <coughs> to meet criteria for possible clinical approval. Uh, unfortunately, Marvel had to be curtailed into what we called Marvel 1 due to sponsor financial issues. We ended up randomizing 23 patients, of which 21 were underwent biopsy and 20 were treated. Uh, we had full follow-up on these patients through six months, and we presented and published this data. Um, the, we did see intriguing improvements in exercise time in the patients who were treated with cell therapy compared to the control patients. Remember that these are completely blinded uh, study. This is obviously not statistically significant given the small numbers of patients, but the findings are somewhat intriguing. I think probably the biggest contribution that we, uh, one of the biggest contributions from the study was that there's always been a question of whether or not you can inject these myoblasts into the heart safely without promoting ventricular arrhythmias. And in fact, we did see a significant burden of ventricular arrhythmias which occurred predominantly shortly after these myoblasts were injected, anywhere from nine to 38 days after the injection. Um, because of this, we actually had a very involved EMC that we coordinated. Um, we made some recommendations to the investigators that they begin amiodarone prophylaxis. So this is an antiarrhythmic that's used to suppress um, these arrhythmias. And it, what we published is that in the small cohort of patients who were fully pretreated with amiodarone, we didn't see any of these ventricular arrhythmias, suggesting that you could use a short course of amiodarone to prevent these therapies or to prevent these arrhythmias and safely give the therapy. So this is important. I think that myoblasts will probably never be developed fully clinically because of these concerns. Um, but these are the one cell type that was targeted to patients who really have scar tissue. None of the other cell types is ever going to be targeted to that patient population. So I think in a way it's a shame that this program was never able to move forward. So the CCTRN in their initial round of funding did fund a trial in heart failure. The three trials they funded were the two I presented earlier in this one. And this one likewise showed no benefit of stem cell therapy in, pre in treated in patients with ischemic cardiomyopathy. Their primary endpoints were um, change in peak uh, MVO2, 
um, uh, change in imaging parameters and change in diastolic, in, I'm sorry, in end systolic volumes, and really didn't show any impact of the cells on any of the primary uh, endpoints. They did show an improvement in ejection fraction, which is interestingly one of the modalities, which is the most commonly measured modality and, pro and the most common primary endpoint, but it actually wasn't any of their primary or secondary endpoints, so it was an exploratory endpoint. And they did demonstrate when they looked, they looked at a bunch of different cell characteristics and suggested that there was a relationship between the number and percentage of cells that were given and the improvement in ejection fraction. And again, what they showed with bone marrow cells is that these cells seem to be safe and that there's a, you know, perhaps a trend toward lower risk of subsequent cardiovascular events in patients that are treated with cell therapy. So I did want to highlight two other cell types that are being um, investigated, and these are cardiac stem cells. So unlike bone marrow cells, which obviously come from the bone marrow and are primar primarily hematopoietic, <coughs> There's some thought that maybe there are cardiac stem cells that are present in the heart that are responsible for that low level of regeneration that I talked about earlier in the talk. Two groups have isolated cardiac stem cells. This is uh, work out of Eduardo Marban's lab, who's now at, um, uh, in Los Angeles. Uh, they, they actually licensed this technology from, uh, from another group that originally described what they call cardiospheres, which is that if you take small amounts of heart tissue and culture in a specific way, you get spheres of heart cells that can spontaneously beat. And if you take these cells and further culture them out, you get what they call cardiac, uh, cardiosphere-derived cells, CDCs. And this was an open label study where they randomized 31 patients who had recently had an anterior myocardial infarction within, um, I believe it's within three week, three months of an acute myocardial infarction, and infused these cells into the LAD between four weeks and three months after the MI. And this was a dose finding study uh, with eight control patients. And what they showed, they did a very nice MRI study on all these patients, showed that there was a decrease in left ventricular scar size in the patients that were treated with CDCs at both six months and at 12 months. And that this was associated with a change in left ventricular viable mass. So what they will tell you is that they are truly regenerating new heart tissue for the first time. Um, and this is also, uh, the, the, there's a relationship between the decrease in scar mass and the change in viable mass, which suggests that scar tissue is actually being replaced by viable cardiac tissue. They've actually uh, taken sort of an interest, oh, I'm sorry, um, and yeah, this is the slide that shows that there's a relationship between the amount of viable tissue and skin <laughs> scar treatment. So they're taking an interesting approach because that was an autologous cell therapy. Those patients underwent biopsies of their heart and then had cells grown up from those biopsies and then infused several weeks later. The problem when you have an autologous source like that is you always have to worry about the fact that autologous sources come from obviously individual patients who are all biologically different and standardizing the autologous cell therapy is difficult. In addition, there's business model reasons for an allogeneic product. And so they've taken the step forward in their next program uh, called All-Star to treat patients with allogeneic uh, uh, heart cells that they're getting from uh, donor hearts. And so uh, they are looking, they are currently in a phase one study, safety phase of their study, um, recruiting patients uh, with an EF of less than 15% and scar size of greater than 15% by MRI and infusing these cells intracoronarily. Um, they are enrolling patients who are both in what they call a healing phase, 30 to 90 days post myocardial infarction like caduceus, and greater than 90 days post myocardial infarction or chronic phase. This is all double blinded, randomized, and is gonna be done at 20 US sites throughout the country and um, is funded both by NIH grants and CERN grants. The other group that has worked on cardiac stem cells is Piero and Versa's group from Harvard. And he isolated many years ago uh, CK, uh, stem cells from the heart that were based on expression of a marker called CKIT. And he's been using these stem cells uh, over the years. This was a single center trial called Scipio that was run by Roberto Boli at the University of Louisville. It took several, uh, I can't remember how long, but I took, it took, it took like three to four years to enroll these patients. These were all patients who underwent 
um, atrial biopsy at the time of surgery, then had to have no change in ejection fraction for a period of time after surgery, and then underwent infusion of stem cells um, uh, into the heart. And showed uh, in a, so this is actually not the final results of their study. They published this in Lancet as an interim analysis of their of their trial, showing an improvement in ejection fraction in the patients that were treated with cardiac stem cells. And the last I heard, they were still, I think, looking for funding to move on into a later phase uh, protocol for this. Um, other programs that are looking at stem cell uh, uh, trials in this area, Cytori, which is recently, which uh, we, I actually just talked to last week about getting Duke involved. They are currently running a U.S. trial. They ran the precise trial for predominantly at uh, the University of Texas uh, and a few other sites, a phase one study looking at their adipose drive stem cells for treatment of uh, chronic heart failure. They currently have a U.S. trial that has six sites, only four of which have enrolled a patient. They're looking for additional sites, and uh, it's something that I think we will explore uh, across the street uh, because they're, I think that getting in early at this phase, they would still be open toward us having a leadership role in the entire program because they're trying to develop a whole program that will go through phase three and likely involve uh, global enrollment. Um, Astrum has also approached us about participating in their ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy trial. This is an autologous source of, uh, from bone marrow cells, so the patients undergo a bone marrow biopsy, the cells get expanded and then infused several weeks later. Mesoblast, which has now been bought by Teva, is, has an allogeneic product based on STRO1 expression, and then there's um, the CK positive cells that I talked about earlier. So there's a variety of people that are planning trials and that are at various stages uh, in this, in this uh, treatment paradigm. I think we would do well in terms of enrollment in these protocols given our significant heart failure interest both at DCRI and across the street. This is the current um, design of the Athena program, which is the Tories program. Again, they're still in phase one, trying to complete phase one as soon as they can. Um, and I think that it might be beneficial to us to participate in this study because um, I think at this stage they're still looking for leadership roles in, in their entire program. So then I wanted to talk just briefly about our program in Refractory Angina, which um, I've played a role in. Refractory angina is a growing problem. It est it's estimated to affect about 2 million people in the United States with about 50 to 100,000 new cases per year. As we get better at revascularizing people and having people survive from heart attacks and other coronary events, the number of patients who have bad vascular and coronary disease but who are not eligible for additional revascularization is growing. And uh, we're actually working on a paper with some of the people in the audience on um, uh, the outcomes of these patients. So, you know, the, it turns out these patients, because they grow collaterals and have preserved myocardial function, myocardial function, they actually do pretty well from a mortality point of view. Their estimated mortality is anywhere from one uh, to 10% different studies, but in our look at the Duke Cardiovascular Database, it's about three and a half percent per year over five years. So, you know, probably higher than a completely stable angina patient population, but not what we see for a heart failure population. And so a lot of the patients that I've been seeing for the trial I'm going to describe actually come from Joe Rogers, who gets these patients referred to him for heart transplantation, but, you know, their outcome is just too good to be eligible for heart transplantation. There were several studies, two of which I'll highlight here, looking at unselected bone marrow cells in these patients. Um, this is a study from the University of... Leiden, I believe, that looked at uh, treating patients with unselected bone marrow cells, showing a reduction in the number of ischemic segments um, uh, in the bone marrow cell treated patients compared with the controls. And then this was the PROTECT CAD trial, which looked at about 28 patients that were treated with bone marrow cells um, and looked at total exercise time and showed a modest improvement in exercise time in patients that were treated with bone marrow cells compared with controls. But there's some reason to believe that selected bone marrow cells may work better than treating patients with just unselected bone marrow. There's both the business model that uh, is helpful in terms of developing a uh, therapy that is advantageous when you have a bone marrow cell population that has some IP associated with it, as well as perhaps scientific rationale 
that by selecting for and isolating the one to two percent of cells that are true stem cells in the bone marrow uh, and not infusing the 98 percent of cells which are pro-inflammatory and may have negative consequences that they may be a benefit. So this is work from Doug Lacerdo's lab over about 10 years ago where he took rats, treated them with uh, uh, saline, low uh, mononuclear cell preparation, a high mononuclear cell population which was unselected mononuclear cells but had the same CD34 count as the rats that were treated with uh, the, uh, the 500,000 uh, CD34 cells per kilogram and showed that the, patient, the rats that were treated with the CD34 positive cells had improvement in capillary density, in ventricular fibrosis, and in ejection fraction and regional wall motion scores compared with rats that were treated with the same number of CD34 positive cells, but in which the CD34 positive cells were not purified. And this has really led to a program that Baxter has conducted over the last probably seven to eight years, where they started with a phase one dose finding study that suggested that getting these cells was safe um, to a phase two study. Uh, this is showing the efficacy from the phase one study, showing that there was some improvement in angina counts at both three and six months, leading to a phase two study, which was actually a pretty large stem cell study for the, for the field. It was 167 patients who were randomized to low dose CD34 positive cells, high dose CD34 <coughs> positive cells, or placebo. This was a completely double-blind, randomized study. No, the product itself is indistinguishable from placebo. <coughs> so the, the patients who got the therapy and the, the uh, interventionists who administered the therapy were all completely blinded. This is very important because the endpoints we're using are change in exercise time, which has a very big placebo effect, and also the number of angina episodes that you have per week, which has a big placebo effect. Um, I would just highlight, too, that Baxter initially did an analysis which was not statistically significant, but then that Duke actually brought the data in-house. Um, we did a confirmatory analysis, demonstrated that the modeling that they had used was not optimal, and the data that I was actually presented is all the Duke analyzed data showing that there's a reduction in the number of angina episodes per week when you compare the low-dose treated group compared with the placebo group, and that this effect appears durable at 12 months. This translates actually into a change in angina episodes of about six angina episodes per week. And we'll talk about the clinical significance of this in just a little bit. Another primary endpoint was the change in exercise time. And again, there's a statistically significant difference in exercise time when comparing the low dose group compared with the placebo group, which is durable between six and 12 months. Uh, importantly, safety again appeared favorable with lower event rates in the patients that were treated with cell therapy compared with the controls, both at 12 months and in the patients who were followed for 24 months at 24 months. So how does this compare with other therapies? Remember, remembering that we have a change in exercise time of between 70 and 80 seconds, depending on whether you look at six or 12 months in the cell therapy treated patients. Well, the one new therapy for angina that's been approved in the last 40 years has been Renexa. And Renexa in, ran a series of trials and showed that uh, they got an improvement in exercise time of somewhere between 24 and 46 seconds. EECP, which is commonly used, has only been studied in one randomized blinded study showed a 16 second improvement in exercise time. And the one angioplasty study that has looked at change, improvement in exercise time after angioplasty, obviously not in a blinded study, showed an improvement of 35 seconds, and that was rated to, uh, granted that was a very old study. But it suggests that the improvement in exercise time that we saw in phase two was actually much more powerful than many of the therapies that have been approved for this indication since. If you look at change in angina episodes, you see a similar story, and that the change in angina episodes that we saw, which is somewhere between three and six episodes per week, compared extremely favorably <coughs> with what Renexa does and what ECP does. <coughs> So RENEW, which is the study that uh, I'm the co-PI of, is looking to be a registration study. It has an SPA process that we went through with the FDA to get a pathway to clinical approval. The primary efficacy endpoint is change in exercise time in 12 months using a modified Bruce protocol, looking at secondary efficacy endpoints of change in engine or frequency and change in these parameters at six months. Uh, these patients um, have a... Uh, uh, go through a, a lengthy screening process. I'm not gonna go through all of that here, 
uh, but they get randomized. The FDA mandated that we have an unblinded standard of care group because they were concerned about the effect of all of the procedures that these patients undergo. This is a process that's inherent, inherent to any autologous stem cell therapy where you have to put the patient through a procedure to actually get the product that you're going to administer. So 100 of these patients will undergo unblinded standard of care and just be followed for safety for 24 months. The remaining 300 patients will be randomized two to one to cell therapy versus active control. All these patients undergo uh, GCSF stem cell mobilization for four days. Then they undergo apheresis on day five. The cells are then sent to progenitor cell therapy, which is actually the company that purifies these cells for both us and for Amersite. Um, they uh, then ship back the CD34 positive cells to us at Duke and then to other sites, and then we inject these cells into the patient using an ova catheter to uh, areas of ischemia, and then these patients are followed for 24 months. Uh, this is just the uh, power calculations that uh, the Casablanca was instrumented, instrumental in helping us out with. We have 90% power to detect a change in exercise time of 60 seconds with more modest power at lower levels. Um, you know, for people in the audience who see these patients, we're looking for patients who have a minimum of seven angina episodes per week um, and are able to undergo a modified Bruce protocol treadmill test. And if, you know, if anybody sees these patients in clinics um, and sees patients who are not eligible for revascularization and are not having significant angina, I'm happy to see them in clinic and further screen them. Here at DCRI, we're performing a number of important roles. We're coordinating the data monitoring committee. Um, Pat uh, is our project leader, is in the audience. She's done a great job looking at um, uh, coordinating all of these various roles. Uh, we have a pre-qualification committee, which is something, again, that the FDA mandated, which is similar to what patients, would, 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 what is used in the aortic valve replacement trials, where all the patients are screened by an independent committee prior to their approval to be entered into the trial. So we screen all their angiograms using some of the technology that's available through our imaging group. We are doing central uh, event committee adjudication, stats consultation, and we'll write the confirmatory uh, manuscript, or the, the manuscript. So RENEW is an important study. I think it's the first trial of cell therapy for cardiovascular disease, which is designed to fulfill approval requirements for the US. Uh, it's powered to demonstrate efficacy on clinical endpoints. Uh, it's the largest currently run US trial in cell therapy and really, right now, as far as I know, the largest enrolling trial in the U.S. With a or in the world with a target of over 400 patients. And I think will really be a landmark study that people in the cell therapy community will be talking about for years to come, one way or another. And uh, so that's what I have for today. I'm happy to take any questions and uh, answer any questions or comments. Nice to hear that. We've enrolled one patient at Duke, or we've got a second patient that's ready to enroll. It's, it's, it's been a challenge. It's very hard to find these patients. The studies enrolled a little over 50 patients out of the 440 that were targeted. But um, it's been a, the entry criteria are fairly strict, uh, partly for good reasons. Um, and, uh, and, you know, and we've had active discussions about what we can do to uh, favorably impact enrollment. But I think it's a really important trial. I mean, one way or another, um, you know, it's the first trial that the FDA has said that this is a good study design and we'll accept it. Um, and I think it's, you know, when I, I see these patients in clinic now, it's really important to them. I mean, the patients that I've seen, um, either we've been able to help for other ways, it brings patients to do, we've sent patients, we've sent several patients to angioplasty that their doctors at home didn't want to do. We sent one, by, one patient that Carmella bypassed, um, and, and we've helped other patients, I think, in terms of helping their medical therapy. So, you know, I think patients, Duke gets a lot of benefit, and the patients that get referred to the study get a lot of benefit, independent of whether they get in the trial. The, the one patient we've had in the trial has had a significant improvement in exercise time. I don't know what he got, but he's doing a lot better. <laughs> Other comments or questions? So, so, Tom, congratulations. That was a great overview. And, uh, and congratulations on taking this on and doing such a nice job for Duke. I'm, I'm kind of um, 
coordinating our activities and leading our activities in cell therapy for cardiovascular disease. It, um, it seems as though, I think this is what your presentation reflected, that there was kind of a lot of enthusiasm about regenerative medicine and cardiovascular disease. Some early studies showing kind of some pretty impressive results. And then maybe not surprising, because this seems to happen a lot with new therapies, then kind of a, um, a period of, of um, you know, understanding maybe there's a lot more work that needs to be done before we really um, figure things out to have an impact on patient care. And, and then this challenge of like, you know, how much mechanistic work do you do? How much, um, wh when do you go into outcome trials, which is what you really need to kind of move the field? Um, you know, how do you uh, incorporate all this information on how to best design and, and conduct trials, including the fact that these are so expensive and so challenging um, to do, so hard to enroll patients in. So, um, how, you know, any more kind of comments on those issues? On like, where are we, and 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 what can the DCRI and what can we do to help kind of strike the right balance in the field? Well, so um, yeah, so I agree. There was a there was a huge amount of initial interest in the mid two thousands. Part of the decline in interest, I think, was financial and not just uh, scientific. Is that that's when the market crashed, and so most of these companies are small companies, and they're out looking for venture capital and looking for other sources of funding, and a lot of that just dried up. And I think that recently, when you go to the cell therapy meetings, the sense that I get is that the excitement level is increasing again. Um, now, many of these companies have been talking for some time about trying to get trials off the ground, and they're still struggling. But you know, other companies are beginning to. Uh, um, you know, move forward. You know, Baxter is obviously a big company, so their funding were new, and they're in a different boat because they're a huge company and have the resources to move things forward. But Cytori is moving forward. They, um, Amrocyte has a unique model because they work. They're, they're a subsidiary of Neostem, which has other revenue streams, which allows them to maybe fund the trial moving forward. Um, uh, and, and so, you know, people are piecing things together. But uh, personally, I think what happens is, uh, I, I guess I get a little frustrated because my take on it is most of these technologies come out of a lab that develops a particular stem cell type or isolates a stem cell type with a marker. They can put together an IND and run an initial phase study of 20 patients at a single site or maybe two sites and put together, I guess, some kind of database and, and publish an initial finding. But then taking and running a well-constructed phase two trial that's going to lay the groundwork for your phase three work is something that I think people underestimate the difficulty of and the resources that it's going to take. And so uh, I've had the opportunity to consult with a few of these companies and how to explain or how to better impart what DCRI can bring and the what we bring that's different from just outsourcing certain segments of their development protocol to individual CROs who will handle constructing a database and having a statistician that will do their statistical analysis is something that I'm, I'm still struggling at how to do more effectively. I think that we could make a big impact in these young companies who are struggling to define a solid developmental program that's going to carry them all the way through. But um, I don't know if that helps. I mean, how to better explain what we bring to the table. I mean, because that's what we bring, I think, that distinguishes us from everybody else. Vicki, where, where does the CTSA uh, construct and what Duke is interested in, in terms of inventions and other things that I hear through Victor Zell and others, where does that fit into something that is causing frustration for Dr. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> so, 
break it down. Uh, the CTSA, we have a fundable score and we're, we're likely to be back in business. Uh, Victor has a personal scientific interest in stem cells and regenerative medicine. We have an enormous amount of uh, expertise and prestige um, in translation of stem cell therapies. I had I wasn't aware of the depth of the work we've done in cardiovascular disease, but it's extraordinary, and we're the world leader in uh, neurodegeneration and regeneration of myelin on the neurons of people born with terrible leukodystrophies and inborn errors. Uh, Joanne Kurtzberg right upstairs is working in uh, type 1 diabetes, working in stroke. You know, just like so many things that we encounter every day, we just have to sort of connect each other um, and build the argument about the, what we can do for small companies, for large companies, more cohesively because all of the talent is here. And even the, you know, many of us are funded and don't necessarily need to build our salary support into every proposal that we put in. We have an incredible opportunity to work co collaboratively, um, not in a sort of billable way uh, immediately, but collaboratively through background funding like the Thrombosis Center, like the CTSA. We just have to get our message. Um, we have to extract it from our heads and we have to participate in the conversation long enough to, to know what it is we have to offer. And that's something that Tom and I have just begun to scratch the surface of. I think one of the, my question really, building on what Chris asked was, are we, you know, you have this incredible opportunity to do a registration study in a cellular uh, therapy. Who's doing the mechanistic work? Who's understanding the effect of inflammation? And who's generating who is understanding biomarkers of regeneration in these people with heart failure uh, so that the next company they, that we work with, we can counsel them what sort of signals to attempt to detect early in you know, phase one and phase two studies. If we're not talking to each other and figuring out how we fit into a solution for a Baxter, we are missing an opportunity not just for Baxter, but for every other company that Tom come in, comes yeah. in contact with. We have to build the the sort of wave of awareness that, that we're capable of bringing to one of these uh, struggling companies. So biomarkers, I really, I really think that our, our collective interest in, in understanding mechanism and being able to sort of detect <coughs> signals of on and off target effects very early in, in uh, the evolution of a clinical program is crucially important. And the other one, one, the other question I wanted to ask was, where is the heart? Where does heart failure fit in relation to their chronic limb ischemia? Is Baxter has Baxter, has Baxter uh, less chronic limb ischemia, or is CLI ahead of heart failure? Where does that fit? So they had talked about doing a CLI trial in the U.S. As far as I know, that's off the table. There, they have a, one of Doug's. Postdocs is a big investigator in Japan, and they're looking at Berger's disease. My literature, or the PVD literature as well, as maybe someone like Schuyler or Manesh do. But that field, I, the sense I get now is it's really struggling. Uh, Astrum pulled their trial. Um, there's a, there's, there's a variety of companies that have looked at doing CLI and PVD work, and Mitch Krukov and others and Manesh have, um, uh, you know, headed the park attempt to standardize definitions in PVD work. Um, but the, the problem is, that, I mean, it gets fundamentally down to none of, none of the biologics has ever worked in CLI. For me personally, I don't understand CLI, I don't understand why you think that a biologic, and essentially what is end-stage disease, which is what CLI is, would, would work. Um, you know, there's multiple signals that autologous cell therapies are probably better in younger people. Um, we know that the regenerative capacity of the, 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 the function of bone marrow cells seems to decrease in both animal models and in human experiments as we get older. So I think that um, uh, I think that 
and, and fundamentally CLI, the FDA will only accept an endpoint of amputation-free survival. I mean, there's been a lot of talk about trying to move the FDA on that endpoint and do a composite endpoint, but I don't think they've moved. I don't think anybody's worked the, their way around that issue. So I think that I'm not sure how much CLI is going to move forward. Pluristem just had their trial put on hold. One, one, one last little um, question about paracrine effects. I mean, it, it's related to the biomarkers and the mechanism, but if you talk to Victor or even Joanne Kurtzberg, the frontiers that are going to help us get around the, the thorny business model. I mean, frankly, anything that is autologous is going to be hard. So if, if we are studying paracrine effects of, of cellular therapies and able to detect what short-term effects we might see versus the, the actual regeneration of cell types. I, honestly, I feel like that is the inflection point for cell therapies. And I don't know whether it's going to work, whether in fact you can get what Joanne Kersberg is talking about right now is taking unrelated uh, cord blood and infusing people without the hope of, of engrafting. What Joanne would like to do is see whether you can get the regenerative stimulation through the introduction of an allogeneic-derived product that lasts long enough and triggers an endogenous effect long enough that you don't actually have to engraft and regenerate. Or yeah, well, I mean, every cell type that I talked about, except for myoblasts, the mechanism is thought to be I mean, even Capricor's CDCs, they don't, those cells, it's known that they don't survive more than two weeks. So all of the, all of the effects that we're talking about is exactly what you're, you know, what you're talking about. And, you know, the, the, the fact is that when you infuse CDCs in a coronary or infuse any type of stem cell into a coronary or inject it into the heart, very few of the cells stay at the heart. Right. Most of them right. are systemic and are, uh, you know, caught by the reticular so why do you have to use autogenous cells? Well, I mean, that's one know. of the reasons why Capricor has gone to an allogeneic model. Is they don't believe that you need to. And, um, huh, this is such a cool uses, uh, allogeneic stem cell. I mean, the, the reason is that there's always been concerns about uh, immune modulated rejection. And whether or not you're concerned about that on the safety side, that it's going to set off a reaction or um, or sensitize people to HLA antibodies, which is going to make them then ineligible for further therapies, be it heart transplant or whatever you're talking about down the line, or whether you think they're going to have an actual reaction to the cells, and if you inject them into the heart, they're going to have an acute re uh, rejection episode in the heart, or whether, or other people are worried about efficacy, is that if you have antibodies to those cells, that the antibodies are going to clear the cells and they're not going to work. So, you know, there, there are concerns with allogeneic stem cells as well. And, um, Different people are, different companies, I guess, are taking different avenues toward investigating. And then last comment or, or question. Yeah, I mean, just, Tom, I, I uh, thank you very much. I want to echo what Chris said about your uh, great presentation, overview of a, uh, and your leadership in this complicated uh, field of, of cell therapy. I mean, it is, it is striking to me that, you know, we're not studying, we talk about cell therapy as though it's one thing, but, you know, it's, it's obviously, it's many, many things, and we don't know how most of them work. Um, and uh, and the and the business model around many of them is is, uh, is challenging because exactly what the intellectual property is that companies are developing um, isn't always clear. And then, uh, I mean, what I was going to ask, and we talked touched on this some, is so, you, know, you started out with zebrafish and regeneration of myocardium, but by the end of it, you were talking about people with normal left ventricular function with you know, diffuse ischemia, you're not talking about growing myocardium there. So what, what are these cells doing? Um, and, do we, and are they doing one thing or are they doing, are they each doing something different? And, and do we understand any of that? And, and then um, you can, I'll, I'll let you answer that in a second, but the, you know, don't, don't beat yourself up too much about the challenges of selling our expertise to companies because it seems like in areas where you know, we're studying a single pharmaceutical and a nice, clear pathway of development. We have challenges of selling the value of DCRI um, to, to small companies or small and large companies. Here you're talking about 
a place that's we don't we don't really know what the interventions do. Um, we don't we don't know how to define the interventions. We don't know what they do, and they don't have clear paths. And so, both the both the challenges and the opportunities for do to uh, stand out and be different from the rest of the CRO world are seem to me to be great. So, yeah, I agree. Um, so, uh, I guess the the first question um, I've struggled with what what you know translational medicine really means, and I guess what I've come up with is that the, the, the pure clinical investigator really just worries whether something works or not. And so you will, and that's fundamentally the primary endpoint of most clinical trials is does this with Bob who doesn't care anything about whether or not it actually helps a human he wants to just understand how the receptor couples and, and what the mechanism of this little intricacy is and so you know most of us are somewhere in between I mean the, the, the we don't have to under, we don't understand I, I don't think we understand how most things that work actually work we understand what they seem to work we use them um, and you know whether or not personalized medicine and understanding or at least trying to gain a better understanding of the mechanism and, and how things work is going to help us um, I think it's uh, probably an area we need to work a lot harder at. Yeah. Well, all I would, would, would say and I'm, I agree with you 100 percent is that the value added uh, as, as you're articulating for Duke and for the DCRI particularly in an area <laughs> that is not just struggle, uh, but doesn't quite know what the, the path is, is that they would have an opportunity to understand mechanisms much better working with Duke than they would anyone else. And it would behoove them to, to do so. And this is just one, one example, there are certainly others. And uh, that was an excellent uh, presentation, Tom. Thanks. Very engaging, quite informative. And Thank you so much, and thanks to all of you for your thanks. questions and attendance. Thanks.